our speaker today, Didi Nunelli. Her parents actually met at Cornell University. She was just sharing that story before we, uh, you know, we let everybody in that her parents met here at Cornell University, their romantic stories based in Ithaca, New York. Her dad has three degrees from Cornell University. So before everything else, there was Cornell. So we can lay claim to her. But above and beyond that, she's a managing partner of Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition Limited, which works across all of West Africa, shaping agricultural policy, creating catalytic ventures and implementing ecosystem solutions. She's also a serial co-founder and founder. She's a co-founder of AACE Foods, the founder of Leap Africa, the founder and chair of Nourishing Africa, and many others. She started her career as a management consultancy uh, consultant at McKenzie and Company. She holds an MBA degree from Harvard Business School, it's a rival in the North, and an undergraduate from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Didi serves on the boards of several major organizations working in development, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, known as GAIN, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, called AGRA, Nigerian Breweries, which is, uh, I think, called by uh, Heineken, and many other organizations. She is the author of Social Innovations in Africa, a practical guide for scaling impact, book that I've read and loved a lot. But today she's here to talk from uh, her new book that just came out in March, Fresh Off the Press, uh, which is on food entrepreneurs in Africa, scaling resilient agriculture uh, businesses that was published in March, 2021. It is a pleasure to have you and Didi talking to our class and our Cornell community today. I'm delighted to call you a friend and I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks and hoping to have a good Q&A and discussion at the end. And with that, I present Didi calling in from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Ed, for those very kind remarks. I'm very grateful and proud to call you my friend too. Um, and yes, we have uh, strong ties to Cornell. My parents actually had hoped I would go to Cornell and I started off at the Cornell Summer College in my junior year of high school and had a great experience. I got into Cornell, but unfortunately chose uh, the straight business path, not knowing I would end up back in agriculture and food. Um, so great to be here and really honored by your presence today. I'm going to be speaking about my work in agriculture and the lessons and insights from my book, Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Scaling Resilient Agriculture Businesses. I got into this sector motivated and propelled by a message that I got when I got to the US, you know, that the face of Africa was a hungry child. I would go to dinner parties and people would remind me that, you know, their parents used to tell them, finish your dinner. They're hungry children in Ethiopia, or starving children in Eritrea. And this picture followed me around and I didn't recognize this picture. It made me very upset and angry. And I committed my life to really creating wealth on the African continent and changing this narrative. Through Sahel Consulting's work, we're trying to transform the agriculture and food landscape in Africa and really unlock the food potential of the region. Uh, through ACE Foods, which I co-founded with my husband, Mezu Nelly, we're also working with about 10,000 farmers and transforming the landscape, proving that probably African food is high quality and displacing imports and also exporting. Uh, we're also addressing the malnutrition challenges in our region. And through my work with LEAP and ACE and Sahel, found out that SMEs are really the catalytic vehicles for transformation in our landscape, not only because over 80% of the food consumed in most emerging economies, and at least in Africa, Agra cited this in their 2019 agriculture status report, but SMEs in every economy are the drivers of innovation, growth, and employment, and they have closer ties to the grassroots, they are nimble, they can pivot quickly. I think SMEs are critical. And because I've been an SME myself through the different organizations that I've created, 
really wanted to understand what challenges SMEs were facing and what we can do to address them. And in reality, they are facing a host of challenges which prevent them from scaling, from lack of affordable and patient capital to difficulty finding and retaining talent, marketing and branding support to pilot, to scale nutritious products, inefficient business models, poor support networks, poor linkages to markets, and in many of our countries, unfavorable policies and sometimes even hostile policies that prevent growth. So I decided to spend a year researching what it will take for the SMEs I had started and the many SMEs I work with to scale. Um, and spent a year as a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Masaba Rivani Center, talking to over 80 entrepreneurs, funders, social innovators, policymakers in the African agriculture landscape. And the first key takeaway is that there are lots of critical realities and promising trends in our ecosystem. And none of these would be a surprise to you. Across the board, entrepreneurs and SMEs are affected by climate change. We continue to experience high rates of post-harvest losses, limited processing in our ecosystem, high rates, and even rising rates of malnutrition, serious infrastructure, talent and financing gaps, poor regulatory environment, serious gender gaps and gender equity persist, not just in Africa, but across the globe when it comes to the food ecosystem. In spite of these critical realities, there are some promising trends. Digitization for agriculture is allowing us to leapfrog in ways that we never imagined. Technology innovations are doing the same, and they're also allowing for climate adaptation. We have a growing a youth population. Um, in most of our countries, 70% of the population is under 35, and we're starting to see slowly youth engagement in the sector. We have a growing middle class, an interest in healthier diets, and a commitment and an interest in the issue around equity. Um, and across the board, trade uh, with the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement being signed, um, a lot of optimism, but continued issues around global trade and inequity in global trade as well. Now, from this work, um, and looking at the critical realities and promising trends, I interviewed entrepreneurs who are scaling. And the first key takeaway from my research is that to scale, you need a compelling business model. And the business models that are scaling have six components that are similar across the board. Number one is that they have demand-driven business models with measurable value addition. And it's very tricky because many times you say, well, we've come in with interventions to solve problems in the African agricultural landscape, but these are usually supply-driven, donor-driven, government-driven, and are not demand driven, which means we don't have consumers or farmers or beneficiaries willing to pay for them because they cannot identify what the value addition is. And many of our pilots fail when it's time for scale up because they were not demand driven or really rooted in the realities on the ground. The second key component is that they leverage technology, data and innovation. And there's no business that will scale within Africa or across the world that's not leveraging technology today not leveraging data, not leveraging innovation. I'm gonna spend time talking a bit more about that. These companies shape their ecosystem. They don't wait for the ecosystem to shape them. They get involved in policy and transformation. They have cost efficient dynamic systems and structures. They know how to tell their stories. They have simple compelling branding and they're able to communicate a message that is compelling and attractive, not only to the beneficiaries, but to funders and partners. And last but not the least, they adapt to climate change. They have agility and resilience inbuilt into their DNA so that they can withstand shocks and risks. And COVID-19 was one shock, but there are many, many other shocks that we know uh, face us on the continent and face us across the world. Now, when you zero in on many of these business models, they are leveraging ag tech and innovation to address some of the critical inefficiencies and fragilities and fragmentation in the food and agriculture system, the high input costs, the information asymmetry, the low productivity levels, the limited access to affordable credit. Um, and what they're doing is leveraging technology to fill these gaps. And there are two examples that I found very compelling. One is called Cow Tribe in Ghana. Some of you have, might have heard of Cow Tribe. And Cow Tribe uses uh, cell phones um, and technology to really link farmers to vet care. So they can get their vaccinations on time, they can 
get um, access to health services when their cows or their uh, goats need it. And this has created a very efficient um, ecosystem for vet care and health care, uh, especially in the livestock sector in Ghana. Another example is Twiga, and Twiga is currently being celebrated in Kenya. And when Twiga started, the founders were actually focused on exporting bananas to the Middle East. That was their initial idea. And as they tried to work out a supply chain for bananas, they realized that they didn't have enough standardized bananas um, that could had a long shelf life. Um, and that even the linkage between the farmer and the market was limited within the country itself. And so they came up with a, a, an idea, let's use the te cell phone technology to link farmers to retailers across the uh, city of Nairobi. And these are fruit stands, literally, that can now on their cell phone order fresh fruits. And within 14 hours, these fresh fruits are delivered from the farm to the retailer. And it's created a huge opportunity, not just for farmers and retailers, but for the data that this uh, exchanges are generating. And now Twiga is working with hundreds and hundreds of farmers and hundreds and hundreds of retailers and has been able to raise over $60 million the last I checked, just because of how efficient and how innovative this model is. And they're looking to replicate this across Africa. Um, beyond Twiga and uh, Caltribe, there's so many other FinTech solutions in the ag tech space, um, uh, solutions leveraging energy, and uh, retail and transportation. And we're seeing a lot of ag tech start startups um, and research institutes also thinking about how to leverage um, technology to scale. We're seeing ag tech in the area of financial inclusion and providing you know, micro insurance to farmers or advisory services, weather data, um, information, uh, market linkages, uh, digital supply chain, last mile distribution of inputs uh, and seeds. Um, and then even uh, big data. So we're seeing a lot of great innovations emerging. Uh, we're also seeing the use of sensors and bioengineering and mobile applications. Um, and because of the cell phone advancement where in 2018, there were 426 million unique mobile subscribers. And the projection is that it's gonna be 625 million mobile subscribers. Many African startups are leapfrogging. Uh, leveraging technology. And we see this a lot in East Africa just because of M-Pesa and what has happened with the mobile money industry in East Africa. That said, it's important to caution the hype versus the reality. Oftentimes, you know, data shows a lot of subscribers, but how many of them are active users? Uh, and then there's also with the technology drive, a lot of a question mark around who the ultimate customer is and who recognizes the value of app tech and who's willing to pay for it. Um, and oftentimes we see funders causing distortions um, and help, uh, forcing or compelling um, investors to focus on what we call the vanity metrics instead of the real change. So I, I want to provide that caution, uh, especially for technology innovations, that it's important to really look behind the hype and look at the reality. And, there are quite a few high mortality rates in the, the ag tech space. Um, through my work at Sahel Consulting, we're seeing a lot of innovation in more traditional ways. Um, and this is in the dairy sector where we're helping processors backward integrate to nomadic communities. And we're seeing the use of solar powered boreholes. We're using technology for extension officers to send data. We're using you know, portable um, presentation equipment in, in rural communities. We're using a lot of you know, traditional and uh, new ways of, of really reaching farmers and connecting them to markets and also uh, financial inclusion. And this is through an, a cohesive approach called the Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria funded by the Gates Foundation. Another project that my team is actively involved in is also leveraging technology and innovation through the use of early generation seed technology, um, and uh, also leveraging what we call S SAH technology to get um, new and improved cassava stand systems propagated across Nigeria. And this is a consortium project that we're doing with IITA and a range of other partners, Harvest Plus, et cetera. So beyond technology and innovation and business models, 
a key finding from the book and a whole chapter is devoted to talent. And this is really relevant because we're speaking to the community at Cornell. If I would say that one of the biggest challenges SMEs face in Africa is finding and retaining high quality talent, especially in the agriculture and food landscape. In fact, through our work, we found out that most students who study agriculture in Nigerian universities is their third or fourth choice option. They couldn't get into medicine. They couldn't get into pharmacy. They couldn't get into you know, whatever was considered more attractive than agriculture. And so most of them are trying to get out of the sector. And so finding talent that is passionate about the sector and getting them excited about the sector is a critical piece to the growth of the sector. Uh, building the capacity of the leader and the entrepreneur to be a visionary that can attract the best and the brightest is critical. Constituting a board of directors um, and sharing you know, not only the burden, but also enhancing the credibility of the organization is critical. And then where possible, um, outsourcing, um, investing in a culture of innovation and building strong linkages with other organizations. And throughout the book, I profile organizations that are doing really unique things to build and bridge this talent gap. And I'll just mention two. One is called New Cafe in Uganda. And it's interesting because when you look at New Cafe, it has 600, 369 staff as its staff strength, but only 53 are full-time. 251 are membership-based field staff, 65 are interns. And so they figured out a way to partner with local universities and international universities to bring in a lot of talent to fill the gaps that exist within the organization. Another very good example is called Good Nature Agro in Zambia, and some of you might have heard of them. And they've created this whole private extension agent system where they put their PEAs on stipends and they have a school for their private extension agents and they're incentivized to work um, because their payments is linked to how much they're able to generate. Um, and so this is one way they've been able to build a workforce without having full-time staff. The fourth key component is really around branding. And this is understated. Um, Ed might realize that in my first book, I did not devote a lot of time to telling your story. The companies that are scaling in Africa have figured out a way to package themselves, to tell their story from their company logo to their company name, their tagline, their brand, their online presence, their marketing strategy, and it's all cohesive. And oftentimes we complain that they get all the funding and all the support, but they've made a deliberate effort to tell their story and amplify their voice. One example is Hello Tractor. And Hello Tractor is very interesting. It was started in Nigeria by a very dynamic young man um, who has now, you know, basically his tagline was Hello Tractor is the Uber of tractors. Um, and initially this, it was going to basically link up farmers to tractor service providers and even mini tractors. And over time they realized that, no, no, they have to actually offer software to tractor producers and manufacturers to enable them to reach farmers. And now JL actually has a company operating in many parts of the world. And he partners with all the largest companies, the Caterpillars of the world and the John Deere's of the world. And they've partnered with him to only amplify, also amplify his voice. And he's been featured on Forbes and Fast Company and Washington Post and BBC. And many of these inserts have nothing to do with his own efforts, but his partnership with the private companies that he works with and the large multinationals that he works with. Java Foods is another very good example, a company based in Zambia. And uh, Monica used, is a lawyer who used to work with Dangote in Nigeria and then moved back to Zambia, started a, an instant noodle company and also now makes nutritious food, super cereals. And she's done a great job around branding um, her Java Foods, sweet, easy, nutritious, and making it really, really fun for young people. Beyond telling your story, financing is key. But a key uh, finding from my research is that there's a lot of funding available now on the African continent, much more than existed 10 or 15 years ago. Um, there are loans and there are incubators and accelerators and matching funds and grants, but many of the businesses are not investment ready. Um, and this is the big challenge. So only a few companies keep on getting all their awards and the challenge funds and the prizes but the vast majority still struggle to access funding because they're not investment ready around their governance, their financial systems and structures, 
Um, and they have not been able to convince investors that they have a strong business model and a clear profitable exit potential for investors. Um, some of the incinerators and incubators profiled in the blue book include Blue Moon. And some of you who have been to Ethiopia know the great work Eleni is doing uh, with the Blue Moon Accelerator, partnering with universities and getting young people who are studying engineering and other courses to get involved in solving problems in the agriculture and food landscape um, and providing seed capital um, to them. MasterCard is also doing a lot of innovative work a CC hub, collabs, and there are lots of examples of emerging you know, accelerators and incubators in the ecosystem, as well as angel networks in many, many countries across the continent. So this bubbling up of, of financial models um, is really exciting and very compelling. Beyond financing, the critical need to shape ecosystems. And this is key because SMEs, unfortunately, do not have large departments with corporate affairs and legal and regulatory issues that can lobby governments and advocate for the policies that they deserve. Um, and so it's imperative that SMEs actually not only understand their ecosystem, but try to shape it, you know, in terms of the policies and the culture and the landscape and who the enablers are, who their opponents are, who their competitors are. Um, I recently provided training to about 900 entrepreneurs earlier this week uh, through Nourishing Africa, an online course. And most of these entrepreneurs do not belong to an association. They didn't even know associations existed in their industries. They've been literally working in isolation. And the challenge is that as you're growing, you then bump into issues that make you realize you really need to understand your ecosystem and be part of something bigger than yourself and collaborate with other SMEs to ensure that the policies, the standards, even the food safety standards are set so that your company not only benefits, but also can create an enabling environment for companies such as yours to thrive. Um, and this is really, really important. An example of a company that I visited that got it right from the beginning and they're no longer an SME is Africa Improved Foods in Rwanda. And it was started by you know, the IFC, CDC, FMO that all put money in with DSM to create this amazing company. Um, and they create super cereals. But from the beginning, they formed a partnership with the World Food Program, with the Rwandan government. And they really, because of all their funders, were set up to succeed. And it doesn't mean they didn't have challenges, but they really understood the importance of map mapping the ecosystem and building a company that could thrive even in difficult conditions and situation. And the last chapter is really focused on resilience and business re resilience, because if, if COVID-19 has shown us anything is that shocks um, are with us and that we're gonna have to keep on contending with these shocks. And research indicates that 43% of businesses never open after a disaster. 25% of companies that do fail within a year. And so it's imperative that we build not only SMEs that can scale on the continent, but SME, SMEs that can withstand these challenges um, and build their financial resilience around saving buffers and insurance and managing costs and managing debts, but also can really adapt to the climate change and the situations that they find us themselves. So what are some suggested way forward? From my book, I'm excited because I really believe that African SMEs can be catalytic, but there is a sense of urgency. Um, and this sense of urgency is, is, is created by the fact that not only are we facing a growing food crisis with COVID, but also food is becoming too expensive for the average consumer. I live in Lagos, Nigeria, and earlier uh, this year, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics released two alarming statistics. The first one is that inflation is 17%. The cost of food has gone up by 20%. Um, for most food, food items, or before that, we're already spending 57% of household income on food. Um, so to have a healthy population and a healthy diet, we urgently need to address these issues. The second key um, indicator they release is that 33% of our population is unemployed. I really believe the food ecosystem can unlock the potential, not only in terms of wealth creation, employment creation, but also addressing these issues, ensuring that we can produce a food that's available and accessible and nutritious to the vast majority of people, but that it's affordable and that people can spend, you know, don't have to spend 57% of their household income on food because they have higher incomes, but also food is, is more affordable and more accessible. And so we realize as entrepreneurs that we have to really take on some of these challenges and address them. 
working co collaboratively, recognizing that COVID-19 has created and worsened some of the fragilities we knew already existed, but also building back better. So in the last one year, apart from writing the book, we've also created a company called Nourishing Africa. And I just wanna share a bit about Nourishing Africa with you. Because through this research, I interviewed 80 entrepreneurs across Africa, and I realized that most of us didn't know each other and that the ecosystem was so fragmented in, within countries and across countries. And so we created this one-stop shop to not only connect and empower entrepreneurs, but to also to celebrate them. And our vision is a million entrepreneurs on this virtual hub. And our vision is a flourishing, sustainable, and just food ecosystem which leverages ag tech and digital innovation driven by Africa's vibrant entrepreneurs to ensure that the continent nourishes itself and becomes a net exporter of food by 2050. So in the last year, we've created this hub. It's live. It's called nourishingafrica.com. It has events, jobs, uh, a space for agri and food entrepreneurs, a members-only hub, funding, lots of funding opportunities in one place for them to access. Um, knowledge, data, and it also celebrates African food because I think African food is the best food in the world. And I think the rest of the world is missing out because we don't know so much about African food. We also have a lot of different services. We offer Ask an Expert for entrepreneurs to be able to access specialized information on food safety and food technology, on seed systems. We have First Thursdays where all the entrepreneurs get together and we have a West Africa regional meeting, an East Africa regional meeting, and we have experts talk to them. And we launched this entrepreneur support scheme uh, with for 2,000 entrepreneurs funded by the MasterCard Foundation and the US Africa Development Foundation, which is has built an online um, a resilience toolkit, a seminar, which is really based on the book, and then funding uh, and ongoing support. Since we started a, a year ago, in June, it will be a year, we have a thousand entrepreneurs that have benefited from the services from 33 countries. Uh, we have over 11,000 um, followers and subscribers. We've been able to connect 50 businesses to funding and we have 15 partners and about 30 knowledge sharing sessions have ex uh, been conducted. Obviously we have far from our million target, but we're on the road to that progress. So as I round up, I just want us to consider a few critical issues that are near and dear to my heart. The first one is that clearly 2021 is pivotal for a lot of reasons. The UN Food System Summit this year, um, lots of agenda setting going on across countries. I'm sure Cornell has had its own independent dialogue. But what we have seen more than ever before with COVID-19 is that we cannot think about food in isolation. We have to think of food ecosystems and collaborate with unusual suspects in the financing landscape, in health, in nutrition, in gender, in climate change, in manufacturing. Um, and that we have to put private sector and in particular SMEs at the center. And I, this is a plug I want to give because I'm a bit frustrated whenever I engage in panels and sessions, there's a focus on smallholder farmers on one end and on the other end on large companies, multinationals on the end end. And we forget this missing middle that are really the catalyst for change. So designing with them in mind is critical. Uh, and this means that as we're leveraging technology and we're designing that we're really thinking of SMEs. And this is really relevant in a university context where you come up with great research and great ideas, often thinking about how to commercialize them with SMEs in mind is critical to the success of any intervention. The fourth is that we have to invest in building talent for the sector. And I, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I really believe we have to revamp our curriculum. The way we teach agribusiness in most African business schools or in most African universities is really outdated. Um, and we have to empower professors to really teach agriculture as a business and to teach business with an agriculture lens um, and really uh, take in the whole e food ecosystem approach in changing the way that our, our young people get excited about the sector and how they also engage in solving problems for the sector. And fifth, we really need to think about how to de-risk investments and, and how to attract more catalytic and patient capital to de-risking instruments, blended financing and insurance. And finally, we need to build bridges. I mean, we started Nourishing Africa to build bridges within Africa. I think there's a lot of opportunity to build bridges between African entrepreneurs and African SMEs and SMEs across the world because there's so much knowledge that can be shared and so much that we can generate together. 
So these are some practical tips that and steps that I want us to consider. Now I'll end with my current mantra. It's a quote, it's a Tibetan quote that says, if I tell you my dream, you might forget it. If I act on my dream, perhaps you'll remember it. But if I involve you, it becomes your dream too. I started by telling you that I got into this sector because of the face of Africa being a hungry child. The face I want you to remember when you think of Africa, a healthy children who have big blue eyes or big brown eyes, head full of hair, great smile, who live out there to their highest potential because they have access to nutritious food and can live full and meaningful lives. And that dream, for that dream to take off, we need a flourishing, sustainable, and just food ecosystem which leverages ag tech and digital innovation driven by Africa's vibrant entrepreneurs to ensure that the continent nourishes itself and becomes a net exporter of food by 2050. And I believe that this can become your dream too. And I want to involve you. So on that note, I want to thank you for listening and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so very much, Ndidi. Uh, we can open up now for Q and A. See a lot of applause there, a lot of hands clapping. So you, nah, so if you want, don't mind sh showing up your either your virtual hand or real hand, and we can uh, try to accommodate as many questions as possible. Uh, thank you. So um, let me see whose hand is up. So while people are warming up, maybe I'll start by asking my own question. Uh, thanks a lot for that wonderful presentation. By the way, uh, Jahil Oliver was actually part of this class a few years ago, so he's a product of Cornell as well. I wanted you to comment a little bit more about this, um, what soft money uh, has impacted the landscape within Africa. I was always amazed by how much kind of some of the philanthropic money being mixed with corporate uh, uh, funding, what you perceive to be the ultimate impact, you know, uh, on, uh, especially on emerging medium-sized businesses. Is this a good thing? Is it corrupting the sector? Is uh, too many people looking for grants as opposed to investment? Can you comment on that a little bit since you happen to work in that space? Uh, and yes. then, uh, let me ask, you want to take one at a time or it's up to you? It's up to you. What do you prefer? All right. Let's take one at a time. It's going to be easier for you that now. Okay, great. So I think there's definitely been uh, some distortions in the food ecosystem and the agriculture landscape because of the grants that have come in um, and because of some of what you've described as soft money. Um, and I think that is because, and I, I, I'll, I'll be very um, specific, because of what I started off talking about, which is supply-driven models instead of demand-driven models. And the challenge for us and for investors is to really test that these are demand-driven models. I believe in subsidized funding for testing and for experimentation and for learning. But when you're going to scale, you actually need to use commercial money because then that proves to you whether it can scale and that pressure to deliver impact is a lot more pronounced. The second thing I'll say, and Ed, you didn't ask this question, but it's an issue that I just wrote an op-ed on, uh, which hopefully will be published soon, is the inequity in financing in Africa. Um, and the Guardian article last year said that of the 10 startups that got funding in Africa, only two were actually indigenous African entrepreneurs. Eight were from the US or Europe. 50% uh, in, uh, this was in Kenya. Kenya is really, really uh, a serious case, right? Um, in, in Nigeria, it's about 50%. So we see a lot of situations where people think Africans are getting the funding, but it's actually not coming to Africans. The funding is ending up elsewhere. Mm. And I remember when we actually applied for ACF, Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund as ACE Foods, we were finalists. Let's say there were 10 finalists. Mm. Um, some of the finalists were in, included Olam. And I said at the time, I said, Olam, Olam is traded in the Singapore Stock Exchange. Why should they be getting, you know, a zero interest loan? Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I know they do some good work, but I just don't think, and they have a whole department that can work on their, their mm -hmm. big, or their business plan versus an SME that has one person who is working all day and at night working on a business plan. So it's mm -hmm. not an playing field. And one of the things I'm pushing in this new, very bold equity landscape and a Black Lives Matter landscape is that we have to hold funders accountable 
to trace where their funding is going, mm -hmm. not just which companies are getting the funding, but who is who's on the boards of those companies and how many Africans are actually involved in those companies and at what levels to ensure that the funding that is being earmarked is actually going to where it can make the most impact and be most catalytic. Thank you, Didi. I will go to Tashi and then Leah for, for questions. Thank you, Didi, so much for the talk. Uh, by the way, Didi means uh, sister in Nepali. <laughs> Just want to let you know. Uh, I, have a, I have a question relating to Sahel Consultancy. I was just wondering, how did you convince uh, the local SME to take a knowledge as an asset class and to invest with Sahel? Because it is hard enough here in America for SMEs. I was just wondering for the, for the developing world or like Nepal, where I am from, which is other developed. Uh, so what will be like, how would I present it as an, as, as an asset to them, not as an, a cost that they have to incur? Well, so a lot of the work Sahel Consulting does is actually subsidized. So as I mentioned, some of the projects we do, our clients is the Gates Foundation, right? But in the case of the dairy project that I talked about, it makes business sense for companies to source locally, right? So you're basically convincing them to put their money where their mouth is by investing in their own supply chain, right? If they can guarantee their supply chain, regular supply of milk, then they can reduce their costs, their business is more predictable. So you're making a case for why they should invest. Um, and so they, they bring some money to the table to invest in their own future. Um, but it takes some convincing and it takes a lot of demonstration. And that's why I told Ed that the catalytic financing from Gates Foundation allows you to, to prove a business case, which then gets SMEs excited about working with you. Uh, but it's not going to be sustainable in the long term if they don't see the value and they're not willing to pay for it. Thank you. I don't know if that answers the question you had, um, but it's a lot of testing, piloting, and then communicating results and measuring as you go along. So we've had to do a lot of like industry awareness, um, making cases. So we have an, an annual dairy conference. We have annual convenings where we're actually showing people opportunities in the sector. We bring in experts from India, experts from Kenya um, to show what is possible from other regions and what can be replicated in our own region. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Leah from uh, NextGen Cassava. Uh -huh. Didi, thank you so much for the talk. I, I'm curious to know with the platform that you have, what plans do you have for changing policies in East Africa? I'm from Uganda. And I think very many people start try to start these small scale businesses in agriculture, but the policies in Uganda do not sustain, do not help Ugandan citizens to, to push on with the businesses. So most businesses die at the stages of conception. So with with your platform, what plans do you have about trying to change policy in Uganda and East Africa at large? Yeah, so with Nourishing Africa, we're actually starting, um, we actually have a presence in Uganda. And what we're doing is bringing entrepreneurs together to shape policy in their countries. And my next book, Leah, you like to know, it's gonna be focused on this issue of how SMEs can shape policy because it's become very interesting to me that so many SMEs don't realize that they have the power to shape policy. Um, and Leah, in many of our countries, there's complete white space, meaning there's no policy. Uh, many of, you think there's a policy on something like Gary. What is Gary? Gary is great at cassava, right, in Nigeria. So what is the standard for Gary? And who determined that standard? And you don't realize that all large companies are going and setting up, coming up with a standard blueprint and get, giving it to the government to adopt as their own because none exists. And so I am pushing for SMEs to basically work with each other to set the standards they want for their industries and to engage in setting those and getting those standards adopted. And there are a number of ways. Number one is joining associations and where they don't exist, forming associations because then there's power in convenings. The second is actually joining um, think tanks. And when I first moved back to Nigeria, I was young, 25 years old, I became a volunteer at the Nigerian Economic Summit. And it's an opportunity to, you know, as a volunteer, I was in the SME subgroup and we were shaping SME policy and writing this policy for government um, and getting it in. 
Um, and so there are think tanks and there are policy groups that are already existing. You can actually get involved. And then the third is I've started writing op-eds. And Ed and I both benefited from um, the Aspen New Voices Fellowship, which was amazing, right? Because it helps you strengthen your voice to write. So when people don't listen, you start writing. And when you write, people start listening. Um, and I realized that enough Africans and enough of us are not writing. We're not sharing our thoughts. And you don't need a big platform to write. And if nobody wants to publish it, please publish it on LinkedIn um, or Medium. And then start sending it out. Um, yourself and good good uh, ideas move like wildfire. Somebody will adopt it and they might say it's their own idea. You don't care. You got it out in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of ways to, to get involved and Nourishing Africa would love to partner with you on Uganda. So please reach out. Thanks a lot. Next with uh, Mamadou. Go ahead, Mamadou. You're muted. Okay. Hi, there we go. Uh, hi, uh, Didi. Very good presentation and, uh, oh my God, impressive uh, background. Really congratulations for everything that you have achieved. Uh, it really pleases us to be part of uh, having an excerpt from your journey. Uh, what, uh, there is a part of your presentation that I would like you to elaborate a little bit on. You, it's always come back to funding, right? In Africa, especially. Uh, you mentioned one of the reasons why people, uh, why startups or SME having challenge with funding because they are not ready or not able to convince some of the uh, funders that they are actually, they have a good business. Let's just put it that way. Uh, what uh, I have just joined, by the way, the Nourishing Africa, I just subscribed. I was not even aware of it. It's through occasions like that, that you can actually get into. So please, could you tell me a little bit about what uh, elaborate on that? What makes a good SME or a startup uh, fundable? What is Nourishing Africa or any other of your networks do? What do they do to make uh, um, SMEs uh, able to reach that standard so that they can be supported? And anything that you want to tell us uh, for people like us, I'm funding, actually, I'm just getting into startup on agribusiness. And I would like to know, I totally agree with you. They are not ready because I have no business background. I have no commercial background, no entrepreneurship background, but I am a damn good technician. I can build and grow those crops, but I cannot build anything else apart from that. So how do we get to that place? Thank you. And great question. So the amazing thing is very intelligent people such as yourself, the first step is actually to put together a board, a board of directors. And everybody says, oh, I have to pay them. No, you don't have to pay them. For the, all the companies I've started, the first thing I do is write my concept note and then I constitute a board of five or six other people, one lawyer, one finance person, one subject matter expert, one uh, branding and marketing expert, because they give me credibility. They give me advice, they give me support. So when people see my company, they don't just see Mamadou. They see Mamadou has five amazing people who have experience and expertise behind him. And Mamadou, you're able to convince them to join your board, not, because, not just because of how great your idea is, but because you're able to convince them that you are committed to this. So that's critical. Governance is critical. And everybody wants to know that they're not funding a one-man business, that you're not gonna use the money to buy a car or build a house but they're actually gonna spend it on what you want, what you're supposed to spend it on. The second is that you have to have some type of track record and a financial track record through what you've done previously. If that doesn't exist, then you have to have some type of track record of credibility. But six months into Ace Foods, we actually did a semi audit because we wanted to show people that we actually have started to generate funding and we have systems and structures to demonstrate that that funding is being utilized effectively. The third thing is you have to pay your taxes. We find that many African organizations, many organizations across the world don't have pay taxes or they have three books. So having, you know, meeting regulatory standards, meeting fiscal standards and actually being transparent and accountable is very, very important. Um, and then finally, you have to have an, a, a compelling business model. So when I look at your financials, I see you can make money. I see that when I give you that money, you know what you're gonna do with it and that there's an exit. If I wanna exit the business, that there's potential that I would have generated some returns. And many people fail on one of those accounts. Um, and so I have a whole chapter in the book on, on how you secure financing. But Mamadou, someone like you 
if you look at nourishing africa you see at least seven pages of funding funders seven pages of hundreds of funders looking for people like you and the question is are you ready for them and can you mm -hmm. convince to part with their money because it's a safe investment mm -hmm. so please check out the book but also check out nourishing africa and there are a few podcasts that we have generated on this topic thank you since I don't see any other hands, I'll, I'll actually ask this question on behalf of students um, who are in the room here. Since you also had an education here in the US, um, what advice would you give to students who are still in that part of the journey uh, where they, you know, they undergraduate or graduate school, uh, they're from uh, the global south or other parts of the world, have dreams and images about entrepreneurship or development, what could you do differently going back to grad school or what did you learn from there that you took beyond what you learned in the classes is there anything that you'd like to share with uh, students who might be considering going down this path yeah so i'm a big believer in the importance of going back home and i when i was at harvard i started the africa business conference and our first uh, conference in 1999 the theme was reversing the brain drain um, and I ended with a quote. I still remember that speech. I said, do not, it's an African proverb that says, do not follow the path, go where there is no path and create a trail, leave a trail for others to follow. And so I'm a big believer that with the great education you're getting at Cornell, there's so much you could do on the African continent, so much. So while you're at Cornell, there are four things you should do. Number one is build strong relationships. Bring strong relationships with your colleagues, your peers, and your faculty. I'm still in touch with my faculty from Harvard Business School, with my peers, and we support each other till this day. It's really important to invest in those relationships. Number two, use the time you're there to test out your ideas. Um, and the great thing is that in the top schools in America, you get a lot of support, but you can also find companies in the U.S. that are doing exactly what you want to do. You can shadow them, you can visit them, you can intern with them, but build that skill set, that knowledge base by leveraging the resources around you in the US because there's so much knowledge transfer that can occur if you build those relationships but also build that knowledge. Number three, I think you can actually start your fundraising process early. There are lots of business plan competitions, incubators, accelerators, even in schools such as Cornell, and you can take advantage of them to start building your business case and shopping it around. And fourth, it's so important to leverage the alumni network, um, locally, globally. Our alumni networks from our top schools are wonderful and a great resource. I still am very engaged in the alumni community, both with Penn and with uh, Harvard, and even with the Kennedy School where I've been a fellow. And I think it's amazing that a lot of students don't leverage the alumni. Network. How many of you have been on the alumni website to see who, which alumni from your school is doing exactly what you want to do and how you can leverage it. I worked for a bit at McKinsey before I moved back home. So sometimes it's good to get experience in the US, but I would say that we need you on the continent. There are a million and one people like you in the US, but on the continent, you're a big fish in a small pond because there's such a need for your talent, your intellect, your passion, your brilliance. So please come back home and make this continent what we all need it to be and help me in achieving my dreams for the continent and your thank, dreams. Is thank you so much, Nidhi. That's a, an excellent point on which to end. I will ask if people can unmute themselves and they open their uh, cameras and we can give a nice warm Cornell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your work. Thank, thank you, you so you. much, everyone. Great engaging with you all. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.